Well, my name is Bill Altaffer. Uh, we're filming at Gillette, Wyoming. Uh, I live out northeast of Moorcroft, about 12 miles. I grew up about 14 miles northeast of Moorcroft, out on Highway 14. Uh, I was seven years old when the, when the storm hit. My birth date's in July of 41, and so I was between seven and seven and a half years old when the, when the storm hit us. So only remember the highlight type things, you know, that a storm, a snowstorm to me is no big deal, except the fact that I got to miss two weeks of school. Now, that was a pretty good deal to a kid. <laughs> and I was visiting the lady here the other day, and she missed 30 days of school. She said, that's pretty neat. She said, I got to stay home for a whole month <laughs> going to school. So we, we thought that was pretty neat. Now, that. was this in Moorcroft that you missed school? Well, I was going to country school. We walked about two miles of one way to school. The typical uphill both ways, you know, and everything. And uh, so what happened for me to miss that much school, the fall before the, in the fall of 48, the highway department always put up a snow fence out on the highway across what we call Pine Ridge. They got out there and it was muddy and the rancher wouldn't let them go out there in his hay field and tear up his hay field, so they just put the snow fence right in the right-of-way fence on the north side of the road. Well, after the storm uh, settled where anybody could do anything, Dad made sure his stock was all right, and then he got on his saddle horse and rode up to see how Frank had weathered the storm. And Frank was all right, but he said, I want to go see what happened at that snow fence. And they rode west there a couple hundred yards, and there was this drift, it was probably 20 foot deep, right in the middle of the highway. It had just hit that snow fence and just went up and, and dropped. And there was this massive drift, you know, I don't know, a couple hundred feet long, uh, right there in the middle of the road. And, and so that just stopped. If there had been traffic out to there, that just stopped everything then to that point. And so, and the wind, as others have probably talked about, that was older than I, uh, it just blowed for days. We just had storm after storm after storm. And uh, they finally got out there with a, with a snow plow, and, and as far as they could go with a, with a V plow, the highway man said he backed up and took a hell of a run at it, and they said it just stopped me, and of course it would. So they had to get in a rotary plow. I had to bring it in from somewhere out of the, our part of the country to finally get in there. And when they got other roads cleared out to where they could get there, then they plowed that out. I wish I knew how they did that because that bank was layered, it was tiered back. I could walk through up on one of those uh, decks up above. I would not walk through that. My older brother, he'd walk through it, but I said, I won't walk, because you couldn't see. The, the snow would just be swirling in there even after we started to school. And so I'd either get up on top or up on one of those tiers so if a car came through, it wouldn't, wouldn't run over me and kill me. And But it, I can remember for you know, at least two weeks after the initial storm, after my start back school, so it would be like a month afterwards, it was still, there would be times when it was just swirling in there so bad you couldn't see through that so drift at all. Help me ex explain this a little better for me. Are you saying that the rotary plow went through this drift and basically dug a tunnel through it? No, it wasn't a tunnel. They had to, they had to go through maybe with some kind of a cat and, and tear it back because it was so deep that they couldn't cut it with a plow. They had to work it down somewhere, and there, you'd be up there like three or four feet, and then it'd be uh, an 18 or 20 inch two foot deck, and then up, so it was V'd down in, but it was stair stepped up. And I'd get up on one of them and, uh, and walk through on that, so I wasn't where the cars would hit So the, the road was like down here? Yeah, yeah. and there was a, this massive V, well that snow blowing would just get in there and just swirl. And they'd have to come through and push it out then, of course, and, and, and get it out of there. But it'd swirl in there so bad you couldn't see 10 feet in front of you. And I refused to walk through that at all, even as a kid. I said, that, <laughs> if a car comes through there, of course, my mind, the people had come through there 40 miles an hour, which they wouldn't have been, but it still, I didn't. Uh, so then, and that was there quite a little while. Uh, I don't remember how long, but quite a little while before that snow finally melted off in there and, and that drift was gone. It's it pretty interesting, you know. To, to yeah, a lot of people told me that the last ones in some places uh, were not gone until July. I'm sure. I'm sure that there were. 
that there wasn't again, that wouldn't hang in my memory. Snow didn't, wasn't a big memory to a, to a youngster that enjoyed playing in the snow. But uh, we, uh, I'm not sure just which direction to go from this now. Uh, we talked about the Army coming in with, with crawler tractors, and I was thinking about that here the other day. I can remember being disappointed. One of the neighbors had come back from World War II and bought a D6 cat and did dirt work around the country, big yellow caterpillar tractor. And I thought, well, now that's pretty neat. And I was looking forward to a big caterpillar tractor coming in, and it wasn't a yellow tractor. I can remember looking out, and it's just a dull old, wasn't even pretty green. And I can remember the, the disappointment that, that I felt when I looked out there, and it wasn't a, but it was one of those army cats came in and plowed us out. And then as soon as they got, plowed the roads on down so his dad could get down to get to some feed, he fed with horse and, and the sled then, but he got the truck out. And then he could come to town and to Gillette here to Wyadak and got a truckload of coal. We were just getting on in the middle of winter. And so at some time he came in and got a load of, of coal for us. And it was just parked the truck along the highway. He couldn't get back in because again, that snow just blowed for, for several weeks afterwards. It just filled everything up. And I'm sure he took the car out and parked it out there too, though I wouldn't remember that because actually up until 49, the truck was our transportation. Uh, we didn't even have a, a runnable car. But uh, uh, I told you when we were here before, the neighbor lived across the road, an old retired gentleman. And when he'd come out to get his mail, he'd bring his coal bucket out and get a bucket of coal out of the truck and take back. And if that, if he got, if he wasn't enough, he'd come out and, and get the, whatever coal he needed until the weather cleared out, the roads cleared out to where his son could get out and, and get him a load of coal. But he couldn't get in till the snow went down in the spring because they didn't plow him out. He just, he didn't have livestock to take to. So, and I've had people ask me, well. Uh, did he ever, did he have permission? And you didn't get permission then. You, that was just, uh, there was no pain for the coal. It was just glad that we had coal there to help somebody out. And uh, I remember uh, talking to a fellow here a while back. There was a coal mine uh, west of Sundance, about seven or eight miles. It was a private mine. And as soon as the storm cleared up to where they could, then they loaded up, the, this fellow had his miners uh, load up what equipment they had with coal, and the, the miners scooped the road out into Sundance so they could start getting coal into people that was there. You know, the people didn't didn't stockpile a truckload of coal at a time ordinarily. They'd have a ton or half a ton of coal in their bin, and so they were just days away from a disaster. A lot of them, and, and Don Dickey had talked about how they plowed. The first thing they did was plowed out here to the Wydac, and that was for the same reason. There'd be people that were just, you know, widows and stuff didn't have a lot to go on. They bought what they could afford when they could, and right. so they had to get coal to these people. But I thought I thought that the rest of them coal miners, they knew how to run shovels. <laughs> just scooped her into Sundance. Uh, and I talked to you a minute ago. I, I doubt anybody has brought this up, but you think about how much different it would have been if this storm would have hit before or during World War II. Before the economics was was really bad, the equipment wasn't here to do it. And during the world World War II, all of our young men were were gone. You didn't have uh, you didn't have the army here uh, available to help out. They were all overseas. And so, if this would have happened a few years sooner, it would have been an entirely different uh, economic disaster for the for the country. It, it would have had a great deal of different impact on it. And you were also talking about how. Uh you had just moved into a new house. Uh, yes. Uh, and so it would have been a lot different for you guys, too. Yes. If you had been in the old house, could you, how did you fare in the new house? Well, the, it, was, it was insulated, Tom. Uh, the old house was a log house. The snow actually blowed through the cracks in the walls. I can remember. And when it was cold, you just couldn't keep the house warm. That old heater would be red glowing hot. And you'd eat your meals standing around the, the heating stove in that old house. And there was an inch board and some hand huge uh, shingles between us and 40 below sleeping up in the loft of that old house. Well, when they built the new house, there was actually insulation available at the time. The folks insulated two inches wasn't a lot. 
but it was stuccoed, it was airtight, and they had put a big Montgomery Ward furnace in the basement, and there was a big grate in the floor right in the hallway. So we were, we was comfortable, there was no problem there, but that old burger ate a lot of coal. You know, it was, it was a big furnace. It's a big house, it's 32 by 42 with an upstairs and a, and a basement and an add-on porch. Uh, uh, windowed in, it's closed in porch. And uh, that's what the coal was for, we burned a lump of coal in it. And, and it just happened to be that we was needing, up to needing coal pretty soon there when, when they plowed us out. And that was, it was a, you know, a blessing to have that cat come in because we lived a half mile off the highway. That had been an awful time getting a truck out to try to get in and get coal. And the neighbor that lived across the road, his son lived nearly a mile back off the road on over in the open country. So I don't know how long it was before he was able to get out and, and get any uh, uh, coal for his father there. And, uh, I, uh, I talked to this lady the other day that was ahead of me in high school year. She was, she was eight years old. She missed a month of school. They lived out this side of Moorcroft, and her uncle drove school bus. And so her dad and uncle had to walk to pastures and find a, a trail around where they could get that school bus out to the highway and get it to town, and then the school system had to get a substitute driver because he had to be home looking after his livestock. And then when she was able to go to school, her dad had to walk her to the, to the highway. They lived far enough back off the road, he just didn't dare. See, I had an older brother to, to walk with. He's five years older than I. But uh, she didn't have anybody to walk with, and, and she's eight years old, he'd have to walk her down and then meet the bus. And the bus quit him. Strange bus driver and a shy girl. Bus quit him going home one night, and she's the only child left on the bus. And the guy's trying to get it going, and an elderly couple came by, and the man was helping him trying to get that bus going. Well, the bus is getting cold, so they put this little girl in this strange car with this strange older woman. She said, I was just absolutely petrified. She said, that woman wouldn't hurt me for the world, but she said, I didn't know that, you know. And she remembered how uh, scary that was for her sitting there in that uh, car waiting for them. And finally they had to take her up and meet her dad because they didn't get the bus going to, yeah. to do that. Seven. It'll quit here in a second. It'll quit here in a second. Can't imagine anybody calling me good looking as I am. Can you imagine people trying to call me? Uh, now that, that, to me, that was a pretty interesting story. And I told you, my sister, uh, we already discussed that. My sister had to be in town for some event in town, and they carried her in because she had to stay in town. We didn't have buses at that time, see. So my dad got her into Moorcroft, or my oldest brother, whichever. And there she was. She was isolated in Moorcroft till they could get the roads cleared out and get something out to get to town to bring her home for a weekend. I think she said it was three weeks before she got back home, 14-year-old girl, <laughs> all by herself in town with whoever she was boarding with in there. That's all she could remember. We. Uh, we had moved the old log house down oh, a couple hundred, 300 yards from the, from the new house and, and the old log granary that had been there and was using it for hog building. And that's the only livestock we lost. We had timber to protect our cows, but the hogs got in there and it got cold and they piled up and smothered two pigs out of probably 50, 75 uh, pigs they had housed up down there. They, but that's the only livestock we lost out of the storm. None of them froze, though. No, none of them froze. They, that, that wasn't a problem, but they'd just get the, get the piling in there, and, and pigs will just keep moving out and, and, and getting on. If they get too warm, they'll move out and, and somebody else go down. But somebody got packed in there tight enough, he couldn't get back up and he suffocated in there. But uh, as soon as the storm's over, they'd go down and scoop out the feed bin and, and get them back on feed. But the cows, it was in, we have a good timber ridge there, uh, part of the, what we call Pine Ridge extent down there and they just get up in the timber and, and they, they might have been kind of hungry by the time they got feed to them but they, they weren't uh, no frostbite or anything like that. So, so we were Describe for me Bill one more time. Um, you, so you were probably five or six when you were in winters in the old house. Yeah. Can you describe uh, a bad storm in that old house? 
uh, uh, the, how cold it got. You said the snow was sifting in. Could you yeah, talk about that a little yeah, bit? Yeah, there, there, there was, there, the, the chinking just wasn't very good in that old house. Our granddad, when their first homestead uh, house burned down, and this house was built in a hurry, trying to get them a place to live, and there was big old cracks in the, in the floor. They had 12-inch, 14-inch boards for floorboard. And it was just a few years ago, it dawned on me, they built that floor out of green lumber. And it shrank. You couldn't play marbles in the house because of the cracks in the floor. The marbles would fall through the cracks in the floor. And the logs, the big old logs, they was, you know, they was 12, 14-inch diameter logs that they built it out of. And the chinking it, it actually snow would blow in and, and drift in on the floor of that house. Well, they, mom and dad had built a kitchen on the, the house after they were married, and it was a frame building, no insulation, but it was framing good boards out there, and they had a kitchen stove out there, but it, it cooked stove, but it didn't heat, you know, just a one-inch board between you and 40 or whatever below and the window blown. So we had a big pot belly stove, as they call them, in the living room, and that thing, I can remember it just growing red hot. And we would we'd get our meals and stand there in front of that stove and, and eat. And our face would get so hot we couldn't take it. And we'd turn around and turn our back to the stove and eat. And our back would get so hot we couldn't take it. And we'd just, you, you'd just turn back and forth. Uh, and that uh, keeping warm in there on the, in them bad weather, weather days. And, and of course, you know, the ki us kids took a, a, a bath in a wash tub. And I've always laughed about that. When you got bigger, then you took a bath in a wash pan. I said, the bigger you got, the smaller the container of water. That didn't make sense to me. We always laughed like that. But uh, we didn't, we just had electricity in 48. I don't remember, I'm assuming the electricity was probably off, but I don't remember because we, again, we had just came from the, from the nice Aladdin lamps, so it wasn't a big deal to be lighting the house up again with Aladdin lamps. But I'm sure it was in 48, uh, the same year we built the house that we got to electricity in there. And you can check the history records on that and correct me if I'm wrong when you do your research. But uh, again, for a child, it had to be something or extraordinary to, to remember uh, some of those events. Right. And, it, the, it, it, and you said, uh, I mean, you know, as a child, it's, it's snow, it's fun, I get to yeah. play, I don't have to go to school. But it still seems to me like this storm still sticks in your head. Oh yeah, it was absolutely more than, uh, uh, even, you know, from history that it was uh, the largest storm we've had in, in recorded history as far as the amount of square miles it covered. But for a child even there, this was way more significant than any other storm that we ever had. You'd have a two or three day storm, we still do. But this thing, in its initial event, was like three days. And then it just stayed on. When they plowed roads in with, to get truckloads of hay into people for, to feed their cattle, that cat had to sit there while they unload the hay and plow the road out because it would drift in till they couldn't drive back out from the, uh, uh, through there. It, it's, you can sit here on this side of it, Tom, and it's hard to stop and remember how extreme it was. I, I wish I could go back and talk to Dad because his memory would be more complete, but I just remember, to me it was an amazing thing, because we'd put chains on the old truck and haul hay to the cows, and you'd dig through the snow and scoop snow, and these were big trucks bringing hay in, and, and they would have to bring it in, and then sit there and keep the cats idling, and that snow would be blown, and you couldn't hardly see to unload the bales and stuff like that. It just, it was amazing, and blowing hay off. And, and uh, I told you, about the rancher up north that called in the county commissioner wanted hay for so many head of cows. And the commissioner said, I won't name him, but he said, we'll bring out that many hay for that many cows, but by God, you better have that many cows on the tax roll this fall. He hadn't been paying taxes on <laughs> many cows as he had sitting out there on that ranch. And that, of course, wasn't totally un unreasonable either, you know, I mean, that, that happened. But they plowed, if it hadn't been for that, you think of the amount of livestock that would have perished if we hadn't had the caterpillars, the army coming in with crawler tractors. Because people had, like Albert had that cat locally, but that was the only cat, and he was six miles away, see? And he had his hands full with everybody just getting in. He lived like two and a half miles off the highway or three 
and had neighbors up through there, so his cat's busy just dealing with with their situation. He didn't have a lot of time to go anywhere else and and do. And so all them big ranchers out out here west of Gillette, uh, those cattle would just starve to death if they hadn't had the equipment in. They'd have lost uh, infinitely more livestock. And were they doing airdrops out here also? Do you recall? They uh, may have, but but not and not where I would have known about it. I. I have tried to get my memory to kick in and remember if if there were any planes around and I can't remember planes coming over. I can remember the, the World War II planes flying over formations out of Rapid City flying over and what a thrill that was to a little kid to watch that. So I, I don't believe there were planes flying over our part of the country. There. But other places where it was more open and and more desperate they did and they uh, they had people with private planes but they would have ways of marking out there in the country uh, we need a doctor or we need this medicine or and uh, we need some this food or whatever and they would they would do airdrops in and and i can remember guys talking about flying over and, and dropping bales out and those bales would hit the ground and just explode and they had to be careful that they didn't hit cattle with the, with the bales, and, they, and I'm sure that happened some, but they, had, they tried to be careful so they didn't uh, uh, bomb the cattle with those bales of hay. And I, I think I told you we lived in Kansas, my wife and I, for seven or eight years here, a few years back, and I can remember them fellas talking about they walked across to snow and greased their windmills. They just, I mean, the practical old farmer down there, the windmill's time to, going to need grease when this is all over with, and it was just easier than climbing the ladder. And they'd walk out and go in the, the hay mow of their barn and then climb down to, to feed their livestock to the barn. It was that, them uh, mills was, and uh, people talking about you could, <laughs> street lights in some places, is you could walk up to the street lights, you know, it, it was that terribly deep. It's, it's hard to imagine. And I can understand that in Kansas, because I went through there in the Army, on a bus, and you couldn't get into the towns. They'd had a blizzard down there, and the, and you couldn't get off the highway down into the, to the little towns. And this is back in the '60s, '63. So. But you do remember the army dozers here yep. in Gillette? I, well, I, I'm assuming they were here in Gillette, but it's an army dozer that came up to, to our place out there because I can remember the disappointment of, of not seeing the big yellow. I, I was excited, Tom. This is. They're going to come in with one, that big cat like Elber had, you know, yeah. and I, I, was pretty, I was pretty tickled, you know, and fooey. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to think of any, uh, I think I've covered about everything you, that the, Do you recall um, uh, people in trouble at all uh, from, the, from the storm? Uh, I, I think there was some talk about uh, somebody having an appendicitis attack or something? Yeah, one of the people that we interviewed here before, I talked about that and they, they had to get a doctor to them or get them to a doctor, but we, if that happened, I, I'm not aware of it around our part of the country. Had it happened, uh, there would have been a turnout of, of neighbors to, to do anything they could to, uh, to take care of it. Uh, that brings me to the next point about people really pulling together. Oh, that well, like I say, with the coal out there, there was no discussion of whether it was right or wrong for him to get coal off that truck. It would have been stupid not to. You know, you expected that, and he wouldn't have expected pay. You didn't, you didn't, uh, you neighbored. You, you traded work. We traded brandings with each other over the years, you know, and helped out. And uh, uh, my oldest brother had appendicitis. He, uh, just after the war, and this was before this happened, he was here in the hospital 58 days. They had ruptured on him. And uh, one of the neighbors had a, had a new car. And he got him down and got, well, this one dad went up and checked and see how he would get along. He said, Jimmy said, if you need to take that kid to Mayo, he said, I got a good car. He said, we'll load that kid up and we'll take him to Mayo if that's what he needs. You know? People and, uh, really pull together. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And a, a little side issue, whether it goes uh, as interest or not, my brother would have died but they had just released penicillin for, for civilian consumption and the doctor got a hold of people back east and they air flighted in 13 bottles of penicillin and that's all, because he, he was so infected, they, uh, that's what, 
It just, I mean, just weeks before, it was not available because they saved all the penicillin for our boys that had been uh, shot up in the war. And, uh, Lucky guy. Well, is that all? I don't know. Is now, it? now, is the pay envelope at the door? Or, or <laughs> No, you signed, you, you signed it away. I, I can't think of anything else, Tom. I've okay, tried to go over my card no, here. No, yeah. I, that's, a, that's everything that I had from our last interview, too.